Yeah. So in, in coaching, sometimes I will start a session by asking, is there anything you need to clear to be fully present? And um, so I thought I'd start with the clearing of what happened to my leg. Some of you have asked. Um, ironically, it was because of play that uh, I got injured. In this case, it was the play of my dog. And um, how many have had dog injuries before that have uh, sent you to the urgent care or, <laughs> yeah. Um, my, my lab, Gracie, has a boyfriend down the block named DJ the Beagle. And they love to play and they play hard and they run fast and they don't watch where they're going. And they barreled into me. So I was kind of run over by them and uh, got an MRI, have a torn ACL. Haven't met with the orthopedic uh, doctor yet to find out more, but in the meantime, I'm just sort of uh, trying to rest and limp it around. So thanks for your patience um, with everything. And so that's my clearing so that it's not distracting and you're thinking, what the heck happened to her? So, you know, there are a few words that when strung together in a sentence that strike fear into my heart. Let's do something fun. Now, that might seem ridiculous to be like, oh, fun. I mean, who doesn't want to have fun? Fun is a good thing. It's just been that for me, fun has usually been something like reading a good book or enjoying a good conversation with a friend, having a nice meal out, going out with my camera in nature or in Chicago, um, taking a nice long nap on a Sunday afternoon on the couch with a cat and a dog nearby. But when somebody else says, let's do something fun, and usually it's my husband, you know, here it is Friday, let's do something fun this weekend, <clears throat> something in me just kind of freezes up. It's like there's a ton of pressure. Fun, in my mind, sometimes means we're laughing, we're carefree, we're joyous, we're doing something unusual. It's about letting go of structure and being spontaneous. And I don't have anything against spontaneous. Um, being spontaneous as long as it's carefully planned. <laughs> who, can, who resembles that remark? <laughs> so I start out by talking about fun because often I have collapsed fun and play and seen those as the same things. And that means that my relation, since my relationship to fun sometimes can feel like there's a lot of pressure with it, that makes my relationship to play sometimes a little complicated and a little challenging. And it's not that I'm wound really tight and don't know how to have fun, but that definition of play, of being silly and spontaneous and letting my guard down, has meant that I rarely use that word to describe what I'm doing. And that really came up for me over these past few years as I've been really diving into photography. Um, I see the world in an abstract way. And so my photography is abstract, my art is abstract, and I don't think you can do abstract without play. But heaven forbid, I go onto Instagram and I write, look at what I played with, because then people might not take me seriously, and I want to be taken seriously. And so I've done everything I can to avoid the word play. Experiment, explore, practice, test. Those are all the words I would use instead of play. And as we hear from psychologists and people that are much smarter than me, anything that we try to avoid is probably something that we need to be moving towards. Anything we push away is probably something we need to embrace. And denying something is a sign that we need to pay attention, that perhaps there's a deficit of that thing that we need to let in and that would change everything. And the, world, the more that the world tells us that we need to take things seriously, perhaps that's a sign that what the world really needs more of is play. Now, I was a little hesitant initially to talk about play. It seems frivolous in the face of enormous, existentially challenging situations that we find ourselves in, especially in these weeks and months of an election cycle. And I, and I wanted to put this in context because I have to remind my, I, part of this is me reminding myself that play is okay. And, I, you know, and, if, and my hope is that it benefits you. Because for the last 10 straight years, we have been overwhelmed with a constant stream of information 
that tests our ability to stay grounded and even to remember to play. We've had unstable political leadership. We've had Black Lives Matter and Me Too movements that are responding to the abuse of women and people of color. We've had a global pandemic. <laughs> We've had extreme weather events and environmental disasters. We've had wars in Ukraine and Gaza. We had an insurrection at our nation's capital. We have growing anxiety over artificial intelligence and what that's going to do to our economy and our media and our relationship with reality and really ultimately our souls. And because of all of that, in the face of all of that intensity, that's why it's a perfect time to talk about play. If we wanna be able to navigate all of those challenges and come out the other side intact, we need play. And for anyone who was there at uh, Saturday's retreat last weekend, Cami Twilling, she said flat out and talked for a few minutes, she said, play is the way forward. And so my goal today is to persuade you and myself that play is a word and an activity that we need to reclaim. And I'm not gonna be citing research. I feel like research on play is probably one of those duh things, like they spend a lot of money to tell us that, that play is good for you, that play is uh, liberating. So this is, this is anecdotal, this is personal. Um, and, and, and some of it comes out of last Saturday's retreat and John Phillip and, and Cammie's visit because they brought up a lot about creativity and play. And I hadn't thought about it before, but it really is kind of a sacred act. Play is something that is, it's, when I say sacred, I mean we've learned that sacred means set apart, but it, I think of it more as it means it's special. You know, there's, there's a, an element to it that is magical. And we need it. We need to integrate play into our lives if we want to be whole. And play is about vulnerability, humility, resilience, adaptability, joy, connection. Um, one thing that came up in pre-talk is about fearlessness. When we're children and we play, we don't really have any fear, we just do it. And, and so it's about reconnecting with our fearlessness. And even as I listed all of those things that we've been through over the past 10 years, it's a reminder that play is something of an escape hatch. <laughs> It's a chance to release some of that heaviness and go back to something that is maybe pure within us. It's an act that helps us to reclaim some of the innocence of childhood when we didn't care what others thought and we didn't think about, oh, this is silly. Because somewhere along the way for many of us, the impulse to play and create gets shut down in pre-talk when I asked, um, the simple question I opened up with was, what's your relationship to play? And several people immediately said, work first, play later. <laughs> and I had forgotten about that little mantra because mine lately has been, I'm gonna play first and, and I've gotta scratch that itch and then I'll do my work. I can't say that that's the most productive thing because play can last a long time, um, but that's kind of how we're conditioned. Work first and then you get to play. And I remember in first grade, I have an extraordinarily vivid memory of um, all of us lying on the, the carpet and having these pieces of paper. Maybe you remember they were, I don't know, you know, yay big. And the top had blank space so you could draw a picture. And the bottom had lines where you could write your story. And I was writing a story about snow. And I sat there on the ground and I had my pencil and I was I was jamming it on the, the thing to make my snowflakes. And the teacher came around and said, Beth, can you make your snowflakes a little bit quieter? <laughs> <laughs> and, and for a quiet child to be told you need to be quieter, like make your art quieter, she didn't mean any harm. You know, I know that. But that, that story stuck with me. There's, and we probably all have some story like that where somebody, and, and it might be as a child, it might be as an adult, kind of put the kibosh on your, your expression and your play in some way, or told you, be careful as you walk out the door. And so we're, we see play as something that might be a little bit um, dangerous. And along those lines, and again, this is what came up for me last weekend, play is a radical act in the face of the seriousness. 
and in the face of the seduction of anxiety and fear that we face all the time. And I put it that way because fear and anxiety, I mean, that's kind of the currency of a lot of politics. And the purpose that it serves is to keep us small. It, it's, it's, and we retreat into it because it's a way of staying safe. And play is saying, nope, you gotta, you gotta kind of let that go. And play is a way of challenging ego and certainty and uncertainty and fear and despair and pain. And it's really a conduit for connecting with the divine that's in us. It helps us to dissolve that ego and, it, and help us to lead with curiosity and openness if we truly let ourselves go and release that urge to perform or achieve or prove something. It's nurturing. I'm just making the case. I'm building my case here, right? It's nurturing. It releases the pressure that's caused by the cognitive load that we carry every day. We're not meant to have that kind of intensity all of the time. And society has an obsession with productivity and purpose. That was another question that came up, is play and purpose, are they at odds with each other? And I would say no, I, I, I think that they complement each other and play often has a purpose, which is part of what I wanna share with you. And play is, like I said, it's about looking at fear and kind of saying, not today. <laughs> um, it's not giving in to fear. It's responding to that fear and pain by saying, I'm not going to let you have all the power. So I hope it, I'm making a clear case for why play matters. It's good for our mental health, our emotional and spiritual health, if we make a habit of playing. And when we consider what else the world needs right now, there's a direct line between play and those other vital needs. What the world needs now is humility. Arrogance and entitlement are obstacles to the good life, which we've talked a lot about here at C3. They create distance between us and the divine and our truest selves. True play requires us to set aside our self-centered ego and our need to be right. We're called to replace certainty with curiosity. We're asked to have that beginner's mind, that state where we're willing to admit that we don't have all the answers, and sometimes we don't even know what questions to ask. We don't know what we don't know. And it invites us to release attachment. The ultimate example maybe is, you know, who has made a sandcastle or built something, a fort on the beach in the sand? And it's fun while you're doing it and you're having, you know, a little adventure and then it gets washed away. We, we, it's, it's like, the, it's like the, um, the Buddhist monks that make the mandalas and whatnot in sand and then they, you know, blow it away. It helps us to just remember that nothing, what did Kent used to say? Nothing, nothing, nothing is ever permanent or it's all impermanent. Um, and play helps us, reminds us of that. What the world needs now is openness and higher emotional intelligence when it comes to managing judgment. On Thursday night, I was playing with my new obsession, alcohol inks, and they're very hard to control. They have a total mind of their own. And I was doing sort of a familiar thing where I was making some certain shapes on the paper. And as I was playing here, all of the inks started to run together and they formed this big blob. And you can tell by my face, blob. And I whispered to myself, well, that was a mistake. And as soon as I said that was a mistake, I realized that I had slipped out of play mode and into judgment and performance mode. When I saw the inks form that blob, when all the lighter colors that I had put on there were absorbed by the darker ones, and I lost all those shapes that I was making, I jumped to judgment. Even though nobody was watching, nobody was ever gonna see it, but I jumped to judgment that I had done something wrong. And it wasn't just about the blob. I went through this rapid succession of thoughts in about three seconds. I used too much alcohol. I shouldn't have put it all on at once. The color is becoming too dark. It's ruining the rest of the painting that I was pleased with. So you can hear all that, too much, I shouldn't have, it was too dark, I'm ruining it. And all of that came together with, well, that was a mistake. 
Who else has had that happen to them? <laughs> By catching myself in the judgment in the moment, I was able to return to that play mindset, the one that I initially set out with, and reframe that mistake into new information. It wasn't, just, it wasn't good or bad. It wasn't too much or too little or too dark or ruining. It just was what it was. And so I was able to just say, I wonder what will happen if, and go from judgment to curiosity. The inks had given me this plot twist. Now, what was I going to do with it? Now, this is just an example of why this is a vital practice for being in relationship with ourselves and others. It's almost impossible to be completely without judgment. We all have opinions, biases, preferences, values, knowledge, experience that turns into judgment in the blink of an eye. We're human. The trick and what we can learn from play is to how to catch and release those judgments so that they don't get in the way of connection and joy and learning. What the world needs now is adaptability. Play doesn't come with an agenda. There might be some loose rules, but maybe we can shift how we see those rules. Let them become ideas or suggestions based on others' past experiences with what we take, leave, or adapt as we see fit. We might have certain expectations of what's going to happen or how things might unfold, but we can't get attached to those expectations. We have to learn how to be adaptable, how to loosen our grip. We hold tightly to so many things. Play gives us that space to try something new with little to no consequence, or at least little or no consequence of anything that, you know, it's something we can live with and learn from. And in your bulletin, there's a, a few short readings, and one of them um, is from an American biologist, Mark Beckhoff, who says, play is training for the unexpected. It's where we learn to be flexible. What the world needs now is a higher capacity for discomfort. We're always wanting to rush to fix things, and we want to be satisfied with those quick fixes. But if we're truly playing and have an open and curious mindset, we're able to sit in a space of not knowing and even feeling incompetent. I have a new theory that, at least it's new to me, that came to me again when I was playing with my art, that if we struggle with perfectionism, it's likely that we haven't spent much time in play. We haven't taken the risk of trying something new where we're expected to be bad at it. Staying only in our areas of expertise or where we feel competent might feel good, and that's important, but it limits our growth. We have to try things where there's no way we can be good at it right away. We have to mess up and be bad at something and realize that we are not going to die of embarrassment. And that is part of how we build our resilience, which we need to counter all of those things that I was listing before that we have survived over the past decade. And so that play is how we might be able to challenge perfectionistic urges that creep into other areas of our lives. I think that the more that we play, the more we develop a certain emotional muscle memory for what it's like to sit with discomfort and come out the other side. So how can we play? We can start by reflecting on what play means to us. I'd ask you all the same question that I ask in pre-talk. What's your relationship to play? I've had to shift my definition from collapsing it with fun and make it more about practice and non-attachment. It's just free-form time. It has no intention besides asking what if, what if this, what if that, and trying to suspend judgment of the results that I get when I'm acting on that question. So you might consider it adopting a what-if mindset, being open to outcome, not attached, setting aside your expectations, enjoying the act of doing it rather than focusing on the end product, reframing it as practice, experimentation, exploration, an act of discovery, but still use the word play. <laughs> it's about traveling light. It's letting yourself relax into the moment and get curious. And while you're at it, and because play for me has also been somewhat synonymous with creativity, challenge any narrative that you might be carrying around that 
I'm not a playful or I'm not a creative person. Notice if you're putting artificial pressure on yourself, like I was with fun, that play or creativity has to look a certain way. My favorite definition of fun, just to go back to that for a moment, comes from an article I read, um, I believe it was in the Washington Post during over the winter of the pandemic. And the essayist was writing about how she didn't know how to have fun anymore, that the lightheartedness of, had been kind of sucked out of her. And so she started asking family and friends how they defined fun. At the end of the piece, she recalls asking her 14-year-old son, hey, how do you define fun? as he rode away on his bicycle. His answer, which he yelled back over his shoulder, was really simple. It's when I lose track of time. Reading that, oh, I, even now, it just, it lifted this huge weight that I had been feeling about my relationship to play and fun. Maybe it was just as simple as that. It didn't have to be about daring adventures and roller coasters and skydiving and adrenaline and laughter. It can be all of those things, of course, but it doesn't have to be. It can simply be the choice to allow myself to be so taken with something that I lose track of time. And by that definition, I'm playing every time I take out my camera, every time I get into a groove with writing or with art. What the world needs now is what our soul and our innermost longing needs now, space to learn and grow without judgment or ego or fear, space to play and mess up and learn that we survive. When I first learned the principles of improv, a colleague told me that when a clown in the circus screws up, they don't try to pretend that nothing happened. Now, I, I only know this anecdotally. I have not looked up to verify if this is true. It just sounds really good, so I'm going with it. They spread their arms wide, they take a really deep bow, and they say, thank you very much. So they're drawing attention to it. They're giving us permission to be human. They're teaching us not to run and hide from our moments of incompetence. They're inviting us not to take ourselves so damn seriously. And in many ways, they're saying, in essence, play is the way. If we go um, with play as being any activity that invites you to suspend judgment, to let go of attachment, to release perfectionism, and let your imagination lead, then I have something I want you to try. This is going to be a, not interactive in this moment, but you're going to go home with some homework. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I went down a YouTube rabbit hole, and I discovered something called neurographic art. Is that familiar to anyone? Oh, it's so fun. It has a very specific therapeutic use, but it's also fun if you just approach it as play. And especially if you feel like, I, I can't draw. I, I don't, you know, me, pen, paper, blank piece of paper freaks me out. Um, and I'm gonna show you just real quick. I did a quick one last night. This is just a very simple example of what neurographic art, like the basis of it. What do you see in that? You see neurons, right? Andy said he saw soccer balls, so I suppose that's, a, that's an option too. But you can see um, the shapes resemble this network of neurons. And it's made by, first you just draw some curvy lines on the page, no thought, no pattern, random. And then once you've drawn them, you go back and you find where are they intersecting. You draw a little C maybe, and then you fill it in. And before you know it, you've got your little neurons and you've got your cells. And that, that you know, forms that little connection there. And by smoothing out these edges, and this is the therapeutic part, theoretically, you are kind of smoothing out, calming down your thoughts. You're smoothing out the rough edges of whatever it is that's been churning for you and bringing some more calm energy. And it's a really easy exercise. You don't have to think about it. Um, you can let your mind wander or you can ponder a problem while you're doing it, but it will reflect something of your inner state. If you end up doing a lot of lines kind of crazy, then maybe there's a lot of sort of churn happening in your head. If you're really loose and open, then maybe there's some, some energy that's flowing through you right now. Um, you can add color. You can doodle. You know, I did one like this where, you know, I just colored some of the cells, made some dots, drew some lines, you can do this. 
right? You can do this. It's, you can, and you're going to. <laughs> Um, Because when you're playing, there's no right or wrong, right? It's just whatever comes out. So over on the table where the outreach is, there's a a donate box if you are so inclined as well. (laughs) Not to me, but to C3. Um, There are pieces of paper. They are watercolor paper. They're cut into the size of bookmarks, many of them, because I know how many readers we have in this room. Many of them are blank, but some of them I have started some lines And my invitation to you is, before you leave here today, to take one of those pieces of paper. And when you get home, either today or tomorrow, sit down with a pen or a marker or a Sharpie and just play. Draw new lines, fill in the neurons, doodle in the cells. There's no right or wrong way. It's not going to look silly. Color with crayons or colored pencil or marker or whatever you have. Since it's watercolor paper, if you've got watercolor just sitting around, try that. You know, dig it out. Um, I've also put some of my play on the table to give you some ideas. So you'll see, you know, a few things like this and and some of the alcohol ink stuff. And I've also shared um, some of the disasters. (laughs) Um, Some of the really bad, you know, now I can look at it now that I've stopped playing, I can look at it and say, okay, that's kind of a mess. Um, Because sometimes when we are, one thing that stops us from playing is because we see the results of other people and we're like, I couldn't do that. That's, that's, that's too good. And we forget that play and dozens and hundreds, if not thousands of pieces of paper, notes on a music page, you know, jam sessions, were hot messes before they got to whatever it is that they're sharing. So our goal is not that you're going to produce something that's going to hang in a museum. The goal is to produce something that just kind of taps into different parts of your brain and gets you in that playful mindset. So I hope you'll take me up on that invitation. If it seems silly or feels uncomfortable, or if you're just thinking, yeah, I I don't think I'm going to do that, I especially encourage you to do it. <laughs> That's the sign that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a do. If you really, really don't want to, then on your walk or your drive or your ride home, think about what activities make you lose track of time. It might be dancing to your favorite music, writing a poem or a short story, trying a new recipe, sewing or knitting or coloring, having a game night, Halloween. Ugh, you can imagine, I, I just like never dress up for Halloween because it's too playful. And so maybe this year I'm going to dress up. So if you're not typically a Halloween costume person, maybe rethink that this year. Just decide you're going to suspend judgment and ask what if and create and be just for the sake of creating, not because you have any intention of sharing it. Just let your thoughts wander while you're doing it without any analysis or problem solving, no expectations, and just let yourself be absorbed by the activity with no concern for the result. Whatever you create, and this is the coach in me coming out, I do invite you later maybe to reflect on it. Consider the words of one of the readings um, in your bulletin from union therapist Dora Kalf. Play is the mediator of the invisible and visible. So what is your play mediating? What was previously invisible that you have made visible? It might be innocence. It might be a forgotten memory or a reminder of something that's important to you. This is not because we need to turn the outcome of our play into something profound and deep, but the coach in me does say that there's probably likely some awareness to be raised if you consider it and give it a little bit of reflection time. So I hope I've persuaded you that the world needs play now more than ever. I hope you'll consider how to incorporate more play into your life, that it's not frivolous, it's definitely not something just for children, nor is it a waste of time. It's essential, it's restorative, it's healing, it's sacred. And in short, play is the way. Thank you.